Hello, all. Thank you so much for joining us. Good afternoon. Um, again, thanks for joining us for today's page turning event. Um, today, uh, Bowdoin sophomores, juniors, and seniors are moving back to campus. And while move in day looks uh, very different than years past. And um, we're so delighted to start the semester um, with this Bowdoin tradition. And we're so glad you're here with us. And we are so delighted um, to welcome Katie Galetta, who is a member of the class of 2021, as our guest speaker today. My name is Marika Vander Steinhoven, and I'm the Special Collections Education and Outreach Librarian here at the Bowdoin College Library. Um, because of the ongoing pandemic, um, we uh, all of our programming uh, will take place online this semester. And while we missed welcoming you into our reading room, we are so delighted to have so many people joining us from across the country. So um, I'm just looking in the chat here. Um, so we've got some participants um, sharing their location as well as birds they've seen recently. And you are welcome to do that. The chat is open throughout the program. Um, we uh, bald eagle flying over Brunswick. Um, uh, short-eared owls in Portland, uh, Fox Sparrow visited Brunswick recently, uh, joining from Lincolnville, Maine, um, some pileated woodpeckers in Georgetown. Um, and uh, yes, as, as Katie mentioned um, to me earlier, uh, she saw the, the Red Wing um, in Portland, which was uh, making the rounds apparently. So, um, Thanks for joining us. I want to invite you to all of our events this semester. Uh, the page turnings happen on the first Friday of the month, and we are delighted to welcome ornithologist Scott Widensall, who is also the co-editor of Peter Vickery's recently published Birds of Maine, um, and he'll be joining us in March. On April 2nd, we'll be joined by Marshall Elith, who is Bowdoin class of 1997, um, who is also the project leader at eBird. And then in April, we will be joined by Audubon biographer Peter Logan, Bowdoin class of 1975. And hey, Peter, I see you out there in the audience today. Um, you can see that Bowdoin and birding, birding connections run deep, um, as is further exemplified by today's speaker as well. Um, if you happen to be here for maybe more of the book than the bird, uh, I would invite you to join us next Friday, uh, that is February 12th at noon, um, when book artist Crystal Colley will be joining us as the first speaker in our Beyond the Reading Room Archives in the World um, online lecture series. And that series is sponsored by the Harold and Iris Chandler Lectureship Fund. Um, and we're really excited to present a conversation with Crystal, who has recently donated um, over 40 of her artist books. So that'll be a really fun program. Um, you can learn more and sign up for our programs on our website, and I'll pop more info about that into the chat momentarily. Uh, Bowdoin College received its copy of John James Audubon's Double Elephant Folio, Birds of America in 1955, um, which was a gift from Roscoe Hupper, the uh, class of 1907 in honor of his mother. Uh, the magnificently large book, um, which I'm going to switch my camera view over to in just a moment, has been on display in the library since the mid-1950s. Um, and in 2016, we began the page turning tradition. Um, if you want to learn more about the book, Bowdoin's copy of it, or to catch up on old page turnings, um, you can check out our online exhibit. And I, again, will pop the link to that in the chat momentarily. Um, so our guest speaker today, um, who again, we're so delighted to welcome, and maybe some of you who have been longtime page turner attendees can recall that she joined us in the reading room several years ago. I'm trying to think, I didn't actually look up the date, but whatever. Right. Two years ago. <laughs> Two years ago. Oh my gosh, time flies. Um, <laughs> Katie is a senior studying biology with a concentration in ecology, evolution, and marine biology. She completed Bowdoin's marine science semester program, studied wildlife management and conservation for a semester in Tanzania, and has spent summers as a research fellow at Bowdoin Scientific Station on Kent Island and as a marine biology teaching intern at St. Paul's School of advanced studies program in Concord, New Hampshire. She is currently working on an honors project examining the effects of herb, herbivory on the milkweed insect community. Katie is the leader of the Bowdoin Naturalists Club, a trip leader for the Bowdoin Outing Club, and a member of the Huntington Bird Club on campus. 
and last year became a board trustee for Maine Audubon. She hopes to pursue a career in conservation outreach and environmental education and enjoys hiking, camping, birding, traveling, and gardening. I'm so delighted to welcome Katie. Um, but before we th turn things over to Katie, um, Roberta Schwartz, who is our reference services archivist, and I will flip the bird. Um, a shout out to Pat Stefko, our director, uh, who normally joins us for this uh, page turning event, but she's off today celebrating her birthday. So happy birthday, Kat. And I'm going to switch my camera over and um, we'll flip the bird and then hand things over to Katie. All right, let's see. So we are saying goodbye to Audubon's rice bird here. And there we have it. Katie, take it away. All right. Um, so thank you so much for that introduction, Marika. Um, and I'll admit when, when you first turned the page, I found it kind of difficult to actually see the bird in this, but luckily I've got a close-up picture that I'm going to share in just a moment so everyone can get a nice good look at the bird. Um, but what we're looking at here is what Audubon called Cuvier's Regulus or Cuvier's Kinglet. So let me just share my screen real quick and we can get a better picture of that little bird there. All right, so here we are. This is Cuvier's Regulus or Cuvier's Kinglet. So take a moment to check this little guy out. And I do say little because kinglets are teensy tiny songbirds. So in life, this bird would probably be only three and a half to four and a half inches long. And he's sitting on a branch of some mountain laurel, which is really beautiful. But I have to admit, I think the bird looks a little bit derpy compared to um, a lot of these Audubon prints that we're used to seeing. Um, so I actually prefer looking at Audubon's original watercolor of this. So let me just switch over to that and you can see what I mean. Um, this one actually looks like a bird to me. I'm not really sure what happened, but if you'll remember, um, these prints are also partly the work of an engraver named Robert Hevel Jr. who took Audubon's original paintings and helped make them printable to send out to his Birds of America subscribers. So usually he did a pretty good job, but looking at Audubon's original here, I personally think he dropped the ball a little on this one. Um, but here we've got Audubon's original and it's a nice lively looking little bird. But regardless of the image that we're looking at, what is Cuvier's kinglet? Um, I'm willing to guess that many of you have never heard of Cuvier's kinglet before and that most of you have probably never seen one in the wild either. So Audubon shot the specimen that he painted in June of 1812 at his father-in-law's farm in southeastern Pennsylvania. In his ornithological biography, which is the companion text to birds of North America, um, Audubon didn't say much about the bird's behavior other than that he initially thought it was a ruby crowned kinglet. And it wasn't until he actually shot the bird and retrieved it that he realized it looks very different. So for anyone who's not familiar, here is a picture of a ruby crowned. And you can see that although both have this really bright red patch of head feathers or a crown, um, the Cuvier's kinglet has dark face patterns that the uh, ruby crown kinglet totally lacks, as well as a dark ring around the colored part of the crown. So as it turns out, after he shot this bird and um, took a look at it and talked to some of his naturalist friends, Audubon could find no record of anyone else having seen or documented this bird. So he decided it was probably a new species and named it after Baron Georges Cuvier, a very famous contemporary French zoologist. What makes this story a little more interesting, however, is that nobody has reported a confirmed sighting of Cuvier's kinglet since then either. So of the hundreds of species that Audubon painted for Birds of America, there are six so-called mystery birds that people today still can't definitively identify. So a lot of these are species that people have spent a lot of time looking into, 
um, oftentimes studying the way the Audubon illustrated their feathers and described their habitats and behavior in order to shed light on their true identities. So some of these mystery species are chalked up to misidentifications, such as in cases where Audubon may not have seen both males and females of the same species together and mistakenly believed that their dimorphic plumage constituted two separate species, which we now know is incorrect. Others might be the product of Audubon's own misremembering. Um, for example, Rats destroyed much of his work in 1812. I think it was over 200 prints, so pretty devastating to his um, body of work. And so he likely had to repaint some of the rare species that he found uh, from memory without an original reference specimen. Um, and some scholars believe that this might have also contributed to some of these mystery birds having um, strange plumage or kind of being harder to identify today. Another possibility is that some of these could have been species that were rare and highly specialized enough that the habitat loss due to American expansion in the 1800s and beforehand led to their extinction shortly after Audubon described them. And there's a few species that are actually uh, thought to be fabrications of Audubon's imagination, um, depending on who you ask. Uh, in order to kind of gain some prestige over other naturalists in his day by claiming to have discovered a new bird. Um, that's obviously a hotly debated subject, uh, depending on who you ask, but in the case of Cuvier's kinglet here, there are three main theories as to what exactly Audubon saw and painted um, in this image. So the first theory is that the bird he found has since gone extinct, like I just mentioned, but in this case, this isn't super likely because it doesn't seem like other naturalists of his era ever found any similar birds. And although Audubon did note that the bird was rare, he didn't seem to associate it with a particularly endangered habitat type. Um, he basically just said that it was hanging out in some mountain laurel. And um, as some of you may know, mountain laurel is not particularly hard to come by in New England woods um, and through the Northeast. So um, that's not super likely in this case. Another proposed explanation is that Cuvier's kinglet is actually a hybrid of ruby crowned and golden crowned kinglets. So pictured here, the golden crowned kinglet is the other North American species of kinglet that we have which does have dark face markings and a ring around the crown. But um, the crowns, as the name suggests, are yellow. And then if they actually, they open up these crowns, both species of kinglets open up these crowns when they're agitated. Um, at least the, the male golden crown kinglets have their crowns. Um, and the inside is actually often more of an orange color, but when the feathers are flat, um, you might get a glimpse of just the yellow. Um, so obviously Cuvier's kinglet's uh, crown feathers are a bit darker. Um, so hybridization might account for kind of the blending of these attributes. However, this also isn't very likely because these species aren't actually super closely related. Um, golden crowned and ruby crowned kinglets are in the same genus, but ruby crowned kinglets are sort of in their own subgenus and they aren't known to hybridize. So if they happen to hybridize, Audubon may have been uh, one of the only people to actually have seen the product of that. The final, the last explanation and probably the most widely accepted one today is that uh, Cuvier's kinglet was actually a melanistic golden crowned kinglet. So this means that it would basically just be a regular old golden crown kinglet with a genetic mutation that caused its feathers to have darker colors than normal. Melanism is a phenomenon that might be somewhat rare, but is certainly documented and very possible for lots of birds and would account for their darker, for the darker red crown and bolder face patterning that Audubon saw. Um, but this explanation would also mean that Audubon's bird was unfortunately not an adorable new kinglet species as much as we would all love to have another one. So since we no longer have the specimen that Audubon used to make his painting, we'll likely never know for certain what exactly he saw. 
but if it really were a hybrid or melanistic coloration, then um, a bird that looks like Cuvius kinglet could hypothetically appear again. Um, and this means that now the only thing you can do to help solve this Audubon mystery is to keep an eye out for funky, dark-faced, red-headed little birds in hope of discovering your very own Cuvier's kinglet. So with that, I'd like to thank everyone for coming and uh, learning a little bit about this really cool little bird. And if you've got any questions, uh, put them in the chat and we'll get to them. Thank you so much. Thank you, Katie. You just did such an eloquent job of describing Audubon's mystery birds, which I have sort of puzzled over and read various different accounts of, but thank you so much and for putting it into the context of, of all of those different theories. That's so fabulous. So um, if you have questions, um, there is both the chat, which is open or the Q&A feature. Um, both of those are available in the bottom toolbar of your Zoom screen. Um, so we'll give it a few minutes um, for questions to, um, to trickle in. Um, I'm wondering, Katie, have you seen the kinglet? I have. I have seen uh, both species. Mm -hmm. um, they are really, they're adorable. They're really, <laughs> really tiny. They're super fun. They're often kind of hard to spot. Um, mm -hmm. usually, at least the ones that I've seen have kind of been up in the canopy and um, Usually the way that you're kind of clued into them, I think, is when they sing. Um, oh. And so usually you hear them before you see them. Um, but one behavior that I'm familiar with, but I think it's the ruby crown, is that they kind of flick their wings. So if you're kind of like listening for them, um, I know that they breed in conifers, so um, in pine forests and things like that. Um, so if you're kind of like listening for like this really high pitched little uh, noise that they make and, you know, maybe seeing some wings flicking around. Uh, they're really cool birds to be able to check out. Um, unfortunately, though, you don't often see their crowns. So that's not, uh, that's not maybe the main thing to look for when you're looking for them. I, I just, your, your comment about them being sort of hard to see is so, I'm, I'm looking at the screen um, and also, and also I'm right in front of the book itself and it is really hard to see yeah. the bird. <laughs> it might be the angle, angle of it. It's not just the angle of, of the camera. Um, mm -hmm. So some questions have come in. Um, well, first is a comment um, and it is that Katie is awesome, great presentation. Um, so uh, thank you, Lori, for sharing that. We agree. Um, uh, Caroline, who is uh, actually our uh, college archivist here, uh, uh, mentioned, um, she said, you mentioned rats eating many drawings. Do you know more about this? Yeah, so I don't know a lot about it, um, but it, as far as I understand it, so it actually, I think, happened when he was in um, Pennsylvania looking at this bird um, based on my extensive research I did uh, the mm -hmm. other day, <laughs> um, <laughs> looking for stuff about this one. And so I think what had happened is he had been kind of, I, I believe this is before he had kind of set out um, to make Birds of America, but he had, um, you know, clearly a lot of paintings of birds that he had done um, as a, just an ornithologist and someone interested in painting them. Um, he had kind of amassed this pretty substantial body of work. He ultimately, I think, and Marika, correct me if I'm wrong, it's like 435 mm -hmm. plates in total. So yeah. that would be all, like, half of them, which mm -hmm. is a whole lot to have to repaint. But basically, um, I believe, so he lived in Kentucky. He kind of had them at home. He went to Pennsylvania, um, I believe, to become a U.S. citizen because he was, um, I know he was born in Haiti. I don't, I guess maybe he was a French citizen. But um, I guess upon returning um, home from that trip to uh, Pennsylvania, he found that rats had gotten into the storage that he had all of his paintings in. And so there definitely were a few um, that he had to repaint. And you can imagine that, uh, you know, he probably didn't have all of his reference birds. Um, and so he probably had to go out and unfortunately shoot a bunch more, I'm sure. <laughs> um, but it's a really, really interesting story. And I personally would also love to learn more about it. Mm. Um, the next question is, where would we see kinglets? Yeah, um, so 
I, let's see. I know that they breed um, kind of up north and to my knowledge, I believe ruby crown kinglets kind of breed further north and then like in the non-breeding uh, season, they are, they go further south than golden crowns. Um, but they like to breed kind of up north, uh, like I said, in coniferous forests. And golden crown kinglets are pretty much found uh, at some point throughout the year in almost all of the country. I'm looking at a little range map right now. Um, pretty much like not the tip of Florida. There are some places in the Southwest that they're not, but they're um, pretty general. And then ruby crowns, yeah, it looks like they also kind of are everywhere. So it's more, I think about the habitat. And then in the non-breeding seasons, um, I think that they, they're not quite as tied to the coniferous forest. They're found more in like deciduous areas and you know maybe mountain laurel like this awesome we just had a comment um from from Dudley who is a friend of the library who lives in Lincolnville and and she says that she sees both in Lincolnville all year awesome um, very cool yeah. uh, thanks for sharing Dudley um the next question is from Victoria and she says hi Katie thank you for such a wonderful presentation any field guide recommendations for beginner birders much love and appreciation yeah, um, so I think that the, well, I will just say, um, like you had mentioned before, Birds of Maine just came out, um, which I'm really excited to get my hands on a copy. Um, and so that specifically is going to be the Birds of Maine. But I'd say in general, um, I would look into a Sibley guide that's kind of considered to be like the crown jewel of American bird guides at the moment. Um, and you could either get the, the Sibley guide for all of, I guess it's probably North America, um, or you can get the East or West. So I would try to check out Sibley Guides East because um, there's beautiful illustrations. It's really easy to use. It's got some really good information. I'm muted. That has to happen in a Zoom call, I think. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's not It's not a Zoom call if you're not muted at one point. Yeah, there you go. Uh, <laughs> uh, Barbara has the question, what sparked your interest in birds? And she says, fantastic presentation. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, so my initial interest in ecology in general and everything was with marine biology. Um, and that's kind of why I picked Bowdoin. And kind of upon getting here, um, I joined the Naturalist Club and the Huntington Bird Club, which is another Bowdoin um, club. And just kind of being here, I got to meet a lot of people who were interested in other kind of ecology things. So I kind of had like my thing being marine biology, but um, some of my really good friends were really into birds in particular, and they're also just a really accessible way to kind of get to know, um, you know, the natural world around you. So a lot of the naturalist club trips that we would take would just kind of be walks in the woods, seeing what kind of birds we can see, seeing, you know, plants and everything. So it really just kind of grew out of, you know, becoming friends with people who liked birds. Um, and then once you kind of get there, you know, every time you're outside with them, you're going to be looking at the birds. So, um, and yeah, I'm, I'm lucky enough that since, you know, kind of getting into it, I've gotten to um, go on a trip to Arizona and help out on a research group looking at owl nesting ecology. So I got to, you know, hang out with some cool owls. Um, being on Ken Island was great because you get really up close to some really cool seabirds that you wouldn't otherwise get to look at. So it's really, it's really been a lot of fun. And that's kind of, um, I would love to work more directly with birds in the future. Awesome. Um, this connects to that question. Uh, Jeffrey, who is um, asking, is the Huntington Bird Club active on campus? I started birding recently and was hoping to meet other people interested. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the Huntington Bird Club's in kind of a weird in-between spot right now. Um, technically, it is a Bowdoin Club that's not recognized by student activities um, for a few reasons, but um, it's mostly in the past, it's kind of just been a very casual um, like email list kind of thing. I would say if you're interested in learning more about birds um, and you wanna join a club at Bowdoin, I would say join the Naturalist Club. Um, 
shameless plug for <laughs> the club that I run. Um, it's basically the same group of people. Um, it's just a little bit more, uh, you know, we've got a stronger email list and because the Huntington Bird Club, because of the pandemic, it's been a lot harder to sort of schedule walks and things like that. Um, so yeah, join the Naturalist Club. You can just go on Blink if you're a Bowdoin student and sign right up for it or email me. Um, and I think that'd be a great place. We've got a lot of people who like a lot of different nature things and I think you fit right in. Awesome, thank you. Um, oh, and Dubly has shared um, one more recommendation um, that Bern, um, Bernard's uh, Heinrich's book, Winter World, has a wonderful chapter on how kinglets survived the winter. So that sounds like a good reading recommendation. And um, that was actually our final uh, question slash comment in the chat and we're just nudging up to one o'clock and you know that I like to keep things uh, prompt with the page turn. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna, um, oh, sorry, one more question has come up and I've, I've shared my face again. Um, so uh, the Cuvier's kinglet, actually the ruby crowned kinglet. <laughs> that's, yeah. our, that's our final question from Rari. <laughs> so it looks like it, the thing is ruby crown kinglets don't have the face markings they don't have any black on their face but uh yeah i mean keep an eye out in the woods and mm -hmm. you never know you know if it's if it really is that melanism that's just a little genetic mutation that happens um so you know keep an eye out all those little kinglets that you look at take a good look at them if you can I, I appreciate that as a, as an assignment going forward. Yeah, um, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there are a lot of people out there who would love to see an example of, you know, Cuvier's King. And I also will add very briefly um, that one of Audubon's mystery birds, um, first of all, it's very interesting because the study skin, um, I don't want to give too much away because it'll be a future one, but um, the study <laughs> skin was preserved and actually is in the basement of some natural history museum and uh, hadn't been seen for years and years and years. And then a birder in somewhere in Canada took a picture of a weird looking bird. And it turns out it was um, a dick thistle with the opposite of melanism um, called leucicism, which basically it, the feathers are lighter. And it turns out this bird that Audubon thought was a different species is probably just this weird coloration of dick thistle that only was seen once again. So you never know what you're gonna see out there. So cool. So cool. Thank you so much, Katie. Um, I really appreciate your time. It's so wonderful to see you. I'm excited to welcome you back to campus. And um, I've learned so much. And I know that our audience um, has enjoyed themselves just based on the few comments that we had um, here in the Q&A. So um, a major thank you to you, Katie. Thank you to all of our um, attendees. We hope to see you in March on the 5th um, when Scott Widensaw, uh, ornithologist and co-editor of the book that Katie mentioned, um, will be joining us. And of course, I cannot end our program without a major thank you to Tony Sprague, who has set up the Zoom webinar for us and is behind the scenes making um, all of this so seamless. Um, so thank you, Tony. Thank you, Katie. Thank you all of uh, you in the audience and uh, go forth and enjoy, if you're in Maine, the uh, snowy, wet, wintry mix that we're enjoying today. Um, take care and we will see you next month. Thank you so much, everyone.